Hello everyone, my name is Mr. Sokowski. Uh, for this video I'm going to be doing part 5 of AP World Review. This is a long study list I have, it's about 65 pages, but I'm just doing a quick run through. The, through. So this will be part 5, uh, continuing from the age of the Industrial Revolution uh, about to the age of imperialism, if we get there for this little video. I'm trying to make them as short as possible, but going into some major key points that you might need for the AP Review. Okay, so we left off talking about the Industrial Revolution in part four. So this is talking about now the age of reason and the ideas of the Enlightenment basically influencing social contracts, but also things like economics, which is a bigger part of AP world because it fits the dynamics of how um, world civilizations evolve from this period of time till today. Okay. So the main one that I would love you guys to know would be Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations because in his idea of the Wealth of Nations, he kind of prescribes the idea that capitalism will ultimately leave um, the world in a better place. Through free market systems of laissez-faire economics, um, the world will become better through that kind of not having control by governments over economic means, making, meaning the making of things, right? So the idea of entrepreneurs and so forth. This is important because this is basically the foundation of capitalism today and that is thought up by Adam Smith. It's important if you get any DBQ, SAQ, whatever on economics so you can incorporate him either as a pro-capitalism or maybe a something to do a contrary or a counter argument of co communism or socialism depending on what DBQ you have or what questions or how you want to interject him. Montesquieu would be the idea of during the Enlightenment coming up with the branches of government. He theorized that splitting the branches of government would be the best. So this is actually the modern day um, version of what you would think of the American democracy. The legislative, the ex executive, and the judicial branches are basically based off of Montesquieu's ideas. Voltaire would be the one that basically implies the ideas of um, the pen is mightier than the sword. So he uses his ideas of enlightenment to critique the issues and injustices happening in the world at that time. Immanuel Kant is the one who coined uh, the idea of the enlightenment. And then you have two famous ones which are Hobbes and Locke that are um, intertwined in the enlightenment. Hobbes would be the idea that life of um, nature without laws would be basically um, solitary and, and um, nasty. So he basically states that, that the world enters, society enters this thing called a social contract to kind of keep us from anarchy and chaos. Uh, they thought of poverty being ended by the idea of socialism. And socialism, this is the opposite side of the coin, would be um, Karl Marx and the idea, he's a German philosopher, and he comes up with this idea of scientific socialism through his work, The Communist Manifesto with Frederick Engel. He basically breaks down all the injustices and issues throughout society it can be stemmed down between two groups, the haves and the have-nots. And if you eliminate the um, ownership of the means of production to make things, then theoretically he could say you could achieve something, quote unquote, a utopia in the world. This is not, he dies before he sees it put, uh, put through uh, fruition with the Russian Revolution, but it's the other side of the coin of capitalism and Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations. So these are the two biggest ones I want you to know because they are the groundwork of um, economics today which would be idea of socialism and communism, which are intertwined into Karl Marx's ideas of the Communist Manifesto. So that's the work that you want to use as the, the definition point. You want to remember that as a vocab term. And then it would be Adam Smith for capitalism and the wealth of nations would be his work to use it as laissez-faire economics, okay? Those are the two most important economic ones you would want to know for uh, world history. Robert Owen started to try to do a utopian society that kind of backfired and that's where Marx comes from. Not as big, but just know Adam Smith and Karl Marx. Uh, then you have the idea of uh, Britain becomes a global power. Several reasons is because it's basically the location of it. So it, be, it becomes the domineering factor in the 1700s. And this is also when you think of the colonies to rebel against Britain. America becomes the first country to embody itself as an independent nation without a monarch. And that comes from the Boston Massacre or the the, uh, the Boston Tea Party. The Boston Massacre was basically protesters were protesting the unjust taxes created by the British. And at this protest, they were shot by um, soldiers. And then that led to the Boston Tea Party, which is a very famous one, which you know. And then this led to the First Continental Congress, which basically they, the people from each, uh, representatives from each 
um, colony from the Americas at the time, which were not the America you think of, they're colonies still. They had representatives come to see what to do with the British question and how to go forward. Um, I'm only going to go very small into this because it's not really a big AP world, but it has a lingering uh, connection to other things that come later on. You have George Washington, the first president, then you have Thomas Jefferson helping create the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and property, and popular sovereignty, the idea of um, independence. These are all intertwined um, ideas from the Enlightenment, so it kind of goes hand in hand with the, the Hobbes and the Locke and the Voltaire and Montesquieu. It's all embedded by the, our founding fathers in America of creating the first uh, government. And this is kind of like a little snippet you can kind of use maybe as a contextualization. You won't really get anything from the American Revolution at this time, but the American Revolution is important because it's, it's inspired by the Enlightenment, and then the American Revolution inspires the French Revolution. Then the French Revolution later on links to the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is the one that you'd want to know for AP World. Okay, so that's kind of like the domino effect leading into the Haitian Revolution, which you will be getting asked with Toussaint L'Ouverture and the idea of Haitians uh, fighting for their independence as slavery, and that's the one you really want to know. The French Revolution kind of is intertwined. It cr it's created by taxation and properly done by the three estates labeled here. And reality is, is that the first and second estate don't pay any taxes, and the third estate, which is the biggest population, pays the majority of the taxes. Their national debt soars, and they're deeply in debt, so they need to raise money and find money. They helped. With, they had issues with the Seven Years' War and also helping the Americans with the American Revolution. So that's also why that's intertwined in there. They uh, coming to the Estates General, which these estates meet. The first estates basically were always being outvoted by the third estate because it's this old system of government. And in a bold move, the third estate declares itself the National Assembly in a tennis court. So that's the very famous tennis court oath. And that's them doing their version of like the American Revolution or their Declaration of Independence, right? You have here Parisians storm the Bastille. That would be their version of like the Boston Tea Party or Lexington and Concord in the essence of fighting. Uh, the Bastille was a medieval fortress basically held to keep down any people that were talking about um, badly about the king at the time. So the American Revolution is the colonies breaking away from Britain. The French Revolution is France is going through a revolution in its own backyard over trying to overthrow the uh, monarchy. At first, they don't want to throw overthrow the monarchy, um, but in reality, that's something that inevitably happens over time. Uh, Marquis de Lafayette, um, he's known as the hero of two worlds because he basically helps with the American Revolution and comes back to the war to inspire the French Revolution. It's very interesting too because a lot of people that were sent over by the French to help the Americans out with the American Revolution go back to France and realize that the Americans have won their independence and yet they're still kind of oppressed by this monarchy that's looming over them. So that's those are the ideas that really inspire the French Revolution going forward. The French Revolution can be broken down into four phases. The moderate phase, which is the um, National Assembly, they declare themselves a National Assembly, no, part, no longer part of this old three-part system of government but they now are representative of the nation, like the representative government we have here in America. Then that doesn't really work out. It turns into more of a radical phase where people are starting to lose their heads, known as the reign of terror. You think of the, the guillotine. Uh, people are not being swift or quick enough for the resistance, so they are basically killed. Then they react to this reign of terror, realizing they don't want to be in this age of, of anxiety and, and fear. And then that leads to a weaker type of government and then that's when Napoleon kind of enters, taking over the um, this weak government. The same thing happens with Hitler with the weak government created after um, World War I in Germany. Moderate phase of the National Assembly, the Declarations of Rights of Man. Um, they basically declare the right, just the same thing as the ideas of the Declaration of Rights of Independence. Remember, this is they're declaring the rights of man because they are in France. They're not trying to break away from France. So they want their own rights, things of the idea of being born and remaining free of equal rights, life, liberty, property, and so forth. Even at this time, though, there were women fighting for the right of independence, and women were inspirational in the French Revolution and in movements throughout history. So it's always important to reflect on those ideas uh, in history. 
uh, Olympe de Gouges, she was basically a journalist who uh, demanded equal rights. Uh, she declared her own rights in the Declaration of Rights of Women and the Female Citizens. So women are not just sitting by idly while things are unfolding in France and all over the world during uh, historical facts. Women were also inspirational because they are the ones who marched on Versailles, literally saying if there's issues going down in France, the king should not be in Versailles, which was off uh, the location of Paris. He should be in Paris, the capital of France, while things are going down. That's also when you get the Marie Antoinette, uh, the idea that they were basically taken out. This is happening in um, the first phase, phase one. Those are some of the major key pillars you want to know here. Phase two, the Maximilian Robespierre was the one that was basically uh, the one that had people start had losing their heads. Literally, heads were rolling here. That, that happened in um, kind of pop culture, maybe not your age anymore. But that's the idea of reign of terror and guillotine kind of happening during this reign. So people were losing their head if they weren't following Suda being part of the rebellion in this new world that he kind of envisioned going forth. He's one of those inspirational people. He loses his head eventually to the guillotine too. Uh, the third phase would be the idea of, uh, or phase three would be the reaction to reign of phase, uh, reign of terror would be the this weak directory phase. You wouldn't know this, need to know this as much for AP World. It's just more of a kind of a snippet of it. But this is when you get the ideas of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte taking over. He was a popular military um, hero for France. He's like the only thing going good for France at the time. So he wins a lot of popular votes. And people think that they can control Napoleon as a puppet. And they give Napoleon power. And Napoleon becomes Napoleon who takes over most of continental Europe, right? Uh, he instills the idea of Napoleonic code. So he doesn't, he's kind of a, a usually seen as a negative figure, but he does instill some of the ideas of the Enlightenment in his rule. The most important thing is, is that after Napoleon is officially defeated in Waterloo, uh, the ideas of nationalism are, are basically the embers of nationalism are lit in Europe and that later leads on to the ideas of nationalism throughout the world, which is one of the major key factors leading up into later on World War I. Uh, Short-lived Waterloo and so forth. Here, this is the one that you need to know for AP uh, world going forward. The revolutions, not just in Europe as much, because Europe is going to be kind of pushed aside. Latin America. If there is any revolutions you need to know are going to be the revolutions in the Caribbean with Haiti and the revolutions in South America during this period of time. If you get South American questions, you're either going to get a little bit of the ancient empires in South America, you're going to get the ideas of the Atlantic slave trade involving South America, or you're going to get the ideas of the rise of nationalism in South America. Those are the three phases you need to know for your South American history and Middle American history. North American history, they're not going to go too much because they have this thing called a push later, uh, AP US history, so that's what they'll be really getting into. And then they also teach AP Euro, or they give the AP Euro test, so they really focus on European history with that class. So the South American history and Middle American history is going to be the ones that they're really going to be hitting on the AP world of students, okay? So those are the ones you really want to get into details going forward. Uh, Congress of Vienna is created after Napoleon. Basically, this splits up Europe going further. The idea of bourgeoisie liberalism, the idea of universal male suffrage going further. This idea of nationalism is inspired in Europe, which later on leads to the age of imperialism going forward. We'll talk about that prior to World War I. Uh, Napoleon's France basically instills the idea of um, nationalism going forward. Here you have Germany becomes unified under this guy named OVB, Otto von Bismarck. He comes from the Junker class, and basically he's the first one to grab Germany, which is a bunch of these separate states, if you want to think of it, or provinces at this time. And he unifies into one country. He is like a swift person of iron and blood to get his way going forward. Uh, unifying Italy, you get a version of Otto von Bismarck going vo uh, here, which would be Count Co Camillo Cavour. He does a Resumento, which is basically the idea of unifying Italy. You won't get too much of that, but that's just something to know that nationalism is being inspired throughout Europe, which later on leads to the next phase in European history, which encompasses the whole world. The reason why I'm kind of brushing upon that is because nationalism and imperialism from Europe connect the whole world at that point when they become the superpowers of that time and that's when you really want to know your um, European history how it involves the world at that time there's a new Napoleon in France one house legislative uh, Napoleon basically the third in, instills the idea of nationalism in France and that links us up to where you really really need to
to know from this part, which would be the Latin American revolutions. Everything's intertwined in world's history. So as the European powers are going through growing pains, they're also letting loose some of the, the connections they have in um, South America. So Latin America, um, during this time, you have the Peninsulares, the people that are living in there, the social dynamics going forward. You have the Creoles and Mizitos and Mulatos, which are basically the broken down socioeconomic versions of the Spanish ownership or the Spanish connection or colonization of places in Latin America uh, prior to the time. Now, if there's one person you need to know that is like the George Washington of Latin America, right? You guys know who George Washington is? So you need to know this person, Simon Bolivar. He is the most important person for you. I'd rather you know him than Napoleon for AP World, okay? Napoleon's really popular. You guys have heard of Napoleon. Simon Bolivar is basically known as the Latin American version of Napoleon, right? Like, he is literally the life, liberty, equality, and fraternity. He inspires all the revolutions going forward in Latin America. You have Haitian revolution starting off um, going forward. You have Toussaint Leopoldour. He basically leads an army of former slaves against the enemies of France, uh, Spain, and Britain. So he, this is the first successful and only successful slave revolt of a Caribbean nation that basically breaks away from the empire. Now, the France at this time, they're fighting for their own equality and their own independence. So that's why it's something that kind of goes coincides with the time that France is weak from their own revolutions. So that's when the Haitian slaves also utilize it as a perfect moment to fight for their independence, and that's how it kind of links up there. But the Haitian Revolution, Toussaint Leopoldour, breaking away the first slave revolt, that's huge. In Mexico, you have uh, Miguel, uh, Miguel Hidalgo, a uh, father. He's basically the uh, person that helps to fight for the Mexican independence with Jose Morales, Morelos, sorry, it was a mezito who called for the wide ranging political reform, and they both help with the Mexican revolutions going forward, okay? If you get a little bit of the Mexican Revolution, it'll be Hidalgo and Mor Morelos. Okay, those are the ones that are basically huge for the Mexican um, Revolution going forward. Now, the one that I said again, the one that you really need to know, would be Simon Bolivar. I can't tell you how important he is. You can see that he basically helped inspire versions. He's known as the Liberator, right? Like the Terminator is a Liberator. He moved down to parts of South America, Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia. He inspires places of Venezuela. Think about how many South American countries that is. Uh, Present-day Colombia, Venezuela, um, Ecuador, Peru, um, Bolivia. He's basically the liberator of South America. Okay, He fights against the Spanish rule and he inspires nationalism to fight for independence in South America. Then you have Jose Martin, which is very important because he helps fight for Argentina and into Chile and help defeated parts in Peru also okay but Bolivar is like the one that you'd get if you ask any South American independence you need to go back into going into history of of um, of Bolivar if you don't know who I'm talking about Don Pedro was more of a quasi one for Brazil but he also helps inspire the idea of nationalism but not to the extent of Bolivar going forward now, nationalism is spread from the Enlightenment to America, then America catches over to Europe, and then Europe catches over to South America, and all these inspirations of nationalism later on lead to another phase of history where these nations now are fighting for dominance, creating their own new version of empires, which leads us into the age of imperialism. Imperialism is important because this is one of those times that you start seeing the world really become not just connected from the age of exploration, but it becomes connected in the sense of dominance by European countries going forward. It's a domination of one country politically, economically, or culturally over another region. They have government states and economic power due to the Industrial Revolution to control. The ones that come into play are going to be Britain, France, uh, Spain, uh, Germany comes into play. All these other countries in Europe become dominant forces. A little bit of America, um, but not as much as the European countries during this period of time. They utilize the industrial age, they have steam-powered merchant ships, they have a technological advantage in the age of imperialism, and navy vessels. They also transform the lands as they get involved with them. Like places like India, they change the topography, environmental degradation of the areas to grow new sustenance and food or products or whatever they need to do to export them. So this is really like imperialism is like colonialism to like times 10. 
uh, forms of rule. You have different uh, forms of control direct, which is basically sending your own people to that area to rule directly. Indirect would basically be taking over controls, like taking over a tribe, but having the chief stay there. And then the chief rules in your under your, your, your supervision kind of thing. And then you would have the sphere of influence would be the ideas of just kind of connection in um, like really close business partners would be the easiest way to say that. Uh, indirect rule, you have a protectorate, which India would be the version of the protectorate of Britain. So Britain takes over India throughout its history, the Sepoy Rebellion, which you want to go into detail with that. And then they break down the Sepoy Rebellion and then it becomes a protectorate, like a little version. It's another it's an extension of the British Empire, right? Like literally, it's also known as a, the jewel and the crown of England. And the sphere of influence is just trading buddies and connections, kind of like a, a business partners. Islamic Crusades in West Africa, a Fulani people under Usman de Fulfidio denounced the corruption of Hussan leaders. He called for religious reforms based on Sharia or Islamic law. So this is breaking into the, north, the places of Africa of um, being basically led by Islam and the influence of Islam going to places um, other than the Middle East. So now it's like North Africa going down. Uh, in 1800s, you have the Zulus who emerged as a major force in Southern Africa under the ruthless brilliant leader Shaka. This is important. This is a Zulu inform information here for African history. He absorbed young men and women into Zulu regiments and the impact of slave trade on Africa. This idea is that even though uh, European countries became very wealthy, you have the Zulus and other tribes um, and other people in Africa being dis decimated and fighting, but also at the rise of different empire and regimes because of this new influence of trade from the age of exploration and the next version, which would be the age of imperialism. You have people going into now the heart of Africa, explorers pushing deeper and deeper into the house of parts of Africa, finding places like Congo, now in Nigeria rivers and missionaries followed suit with this idea of breaking open the heart of Africa. In the age of imperialism it's important to realize that Africa was only kind of traded with the coast but now as these European countries want more and more and more and becoming these bigger and bigger empires they start to literally look at Africa as not just a place to trade with the coastal line but to break apart and, and conquer. It's a scramble for Africa. It's the, literally the carving up of Africa. And it starts with explorers going on earlier with David Livingston and Livingston gets lost. Henry Stanley goes looking for him and Han Stanley later finds him and Stanley is hired by King Leopold II. Um, this is Belgium and Belgium is the first to utilize contracts that are basically um, subduing African tribes and African people under kind of conquest of imperialism and through this type of um, control and imperialistic move by Belgium they become very wealthy. Now through this type of um, domination over the people of Africa, other European no countries realize that Belgium has become very wealthy from this and they want in on it too. So like uh, I like to say to my students, like a pinata opening up at a, at a birthday party when you're little, literally all the European countries kind of scramble for Africa, like the pinata has been broken apart and they literally carve up this nation that's not theirs as their own. Other wealth, they, they basically exploit the riches of rubber, ivory, of um, Africa, and Africa, it's conquest in North Africa. Going forward, um, Britain takes over more parts and other countries join in. They take over the part of South uh, Africa, which is earlier um, the descendants of the Dutch in Cape Town. Uh, when the age of exploration was going, the Dutch had settled up the first permanent colony in South Africa to connect Europe to the Indies, right? India for the first version of um, the Indian Ocean trade. But as the Dutch are getting kind of pushed aside in the age of imperialism and, and England's coming in, they start to reconquer this area of South Africa and they push the descendants of the Dutch that were living there. And this is, they're known as the Boers. So this starts the first Boer War. And in it, um, the English to kick out like the descendants of the Dutch and they basically take over the parts of South Africa, creating the Union of South Africa. This is this control over from England in South Africa is only broken apart fully after um, Nelson Mandela in the 80s basically breaks away the last kind of remnants of uh, colonial control over um, Africa.
So that's still remnants into Owen to the 1980s. You guys have heard Nelson Mandela. So that's that kind of connection there. Uh, you would hear of um, India being broken apart from the age of imperialism with Gandhi being the first person to, for the leader of breaking India away from England as an independent power too. And then you would have a Mandela from Africa. Uh, but this is still in the middle of it as it's growing imperialism. So you have Portugal taking parts of Angola, Mozambique, Italy takes parts of Libya, and Portugal takes parts of southwestern Africa and places of um, like Cameroon and Togo. There were people resisting the age of imperialism but it still uh, was too dominant by the European countries. So, uh, Samori Tour fought against the French forces in West Africa. Ya Asantiwa was a woman who actually fought the British in the last Asante War. Another woman, Nahanda of the Shona in Zimbabwe, was a symbol of fighting against imperialist forces in Africa. So, it wasn't that they were um, oblivious to the fact that Europeans were breaking apart their country and culture and civilizations. It's just that it was just it was it's just a flood of Europeans coming in for the greed of making money, taking over and carving out parts that basically led to the downfall of Africa and the breaking apart of Africa as a imperialistic domain rather than a country. During this time too, you start seeing the changes of, of Middle Eastern powers because these imperialistic powers from Europe are becoming so dominant. Ottomans in the Middle East, Safavids in Persia, and Mughals in India start to basically change, and it's, it's the downfall of these areas. From the 1780s, the reforms sprang up across various Muslim regions of Africa and Asia. So the Ottoman Empire is on the downside, the Safavids in per Persia are on the downside, like going down in their, their control and power, and Mughals in India are going down. If you don't know these three, you need to know at least Ottomans and Mughals in India. Like it's super important you know what I'm talking about there because that's going to be AP world all the way. They face serious pashas, uh, provisional rulers, and this is the downfall of the Ottoman Empire. The uh, Ottoman Empire, was just the history of it is that it was so multi-ethnic that that was one way they were controlling it through the religion of Islam, which was very adaptable for multi-ethnic populations. But when this new idea of nationalism arises all around the world, it also becomes a focal point of places like the Ottoman Empire that are multi-ethnic to try to break away. And they break away when these empires are becoming weaker in history. In the 1700s, westernization of Ottoman Empire improved conditions of the Ottomans. The, adoptation, uh, uh, the adoption of western uh, ideas increased tensions and officials started to change and inspired by this idea of independence. Sultans were the representatives of the Turkish Empire. They rejected reform to rebuild. And during this time, there are great tensions between Turkish nationalists and minority people, leading to genocides, which are basically wiping out people either through religion or race or culture or language from one group to another. The fall of the Mughal Empire is also intertwined with the idea of Britain taking over India. Um, and for 200 years, the Mughal Empire governed a powerful empire in India. This is an important one for European history. Not the, British ver not the British view of it, but the Indian view of it from the imperialistic powers of Britain. The Mughal Empire collapsed um, from a lack of strong rulers. Uh, they were broken apart. Even though they were unified in the idea of an empire of India, there were provisional... Uh, uh, no, there were, sorry, there were princes that were broken apart into these kind of states or, or sections. And when Britain came in, they weren't able to unify against an outside force such as Britain. Uh, East India Company takes over British East India com won trading rights over the fringes of Mughal and then over time with the Sepoy Rebellion literally just took over completely. They conquered India by exploiting its diversity. When they took over they had these Sepoys or Indian soldiers in the service for England and also they were upset because um, the Indian people because they were also Hindu wives were allowed to remarry under the ideas of British law. This led to the Sepoy Rebellion, which the Sepoys, these Indian officers, rebelled against the British. The British crushed them, and after this, they completely dominated India as a protectorate, right? Like the idea that it's a mini version of the control of England, like the, the jewel in the crown. Uh, viceroys were British that were set up in the name of the Queen, and the Britons saw India as a source of raw materials. This is the idea of deforestation or cutting trees. The environmental degradation can be seen here with Britain taking over places of India for control of ch changing the actual landscape in that area, 
during the age of imperialism. If it's the age of exploration, or sorry, the age of um, the Atlantic slave trade, it'd be of how it changes the landscape of the Americas during that time. But here it'd be the age of imperialism would be the idea of deforestation for growing things, especially opium, which later on is um, sold to the Chinese, and the Chinese are addicted to this, leading to the opium wars later on. Ram um, Mahum Roy was combined with westernizations while keeping traditional um, Muslim and Hindu cultures combined. He's trying to create the unity of India throughout, but you'd be more on the ideas of um, what I said in these beginning parts. The Sepoy Rebellion is huge, and the Indian agriculture being changed. China in the age of imperialism, they were a major power, but they start to fall to the West for two major reasons. They don't, they're not up to date with the Industrial Revolution, and they had a, just general periods of decline, which was later leaded, uh, connected to the ideas of opium being sold to them by the British that was grown in um, India. The idea of being uh, linked into the idea of uh, drug drugs basically led to the downfall of China. Um, and this led them to try to fight back with the opium war against the British. And that was also crushed by the British. But before that happened, the Americans came in and said, uh, accepted the Treaty of Nanjing. Sorry, the, the, the Americans came in and led an open door policy so your, uh, no country in Europe could fully dominate China because it become too powerful. But in reality, uh, this is the downfall of China and a lot of silver that they had accumulated during the age of exploration is now being funneled back out of China, back into Europe. Indemnity, which is a payment for losses of war, and extraterritoriality, which is basically living under the ideas of their control. The Taiping Rebellion uh, was the Qing Dynasty was in decline. Many peasants were uprising against the ideas of their once great uh, civilization, which was the Qing Dynasty. Effects of many peasant uprisings, the Taiping Rebellion lasted from 1850 to 1864 and devastating revolts in peasant history. They won control over parts of large China and held out for 14 years. Um, basically, this is a peasant uprising showing you how weak and in, de in decline uh, China is during the age of imperialism while Europe is running wild now. Uh, war with Japan, the Sino-Japanese War, which is Sino's uh, land for uh, Chinese. So this would be the Chinese-Japanese War. And this led to China to open up to the West and carve out uh, uh, Chinese spheres of influence. After the Sino-Japanese War, um, America comes in and says, open door policy, which keeps Chinese trade open to everyone on an equal basis. And then we'll talk about uh, the idea of that going forward. Guan Yu launched 100 Days of Reform. He's a famous China, a Japanese leader, and he kind of sees what's going on and wanted to change um, the issues going forward, modernizing his country to keep up with the rest of the West. The Boxer Rebellion uh, or Boxer Uprising is the most important one you want to know for Japanese um, revolutions or uprisings during this age. It was anti feelings against um, the ideas of Western versions or these foreign devils kind of coming in and pushing them out that they were feeling with a very um, un Chinese uh, going forward uh, under Guan Yu. The last thing we'll be talking about with the idea of the Suez Canal was the artificial sea level uh, opening in Egypt, connecting the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea through is the through the Suez Canal. The effort for basically advancing uh, Egypt was Muhammad Ali sought international financings to plan the idea of the Suez Canal, and this is something that was actually in the news recently because it was blocked by the boat that got stuck there. But this is important because it links up. It is the first time that the country can kind of trade water without going around Africa so Europe can connect to places like India without having to go all the way around Africa, which is basically started the age of exploration, right? The idea of finding a quicker route to India. Uh, you guys, if you hung with me this far, congratulations. I know it was kind of a lot, but it, just try to hit the, the points that have the little at sign at them because those are the most important ones that you would get questions on and then no general people that I kind of covered on the Haitian Revolution is huge uh, what else we have here Simon Bolivar Jose Martin Father Hidalgo huge uh, nationalism is the idea that kind of spurs on it starts from the age of enlightenment which leads to the French Revolution sorry the age of enlightenment leads to the American Revolution 
which leads to the French Revolution, which leads to the Haitian Revolution. The Haitian Revolution is the one that you guys get, will be picked on going forward. Uh, you guys would get the ideas of the imperialism view, but not from the European side. You would get it for the, either the Chinese side, the Japanese side, or the African side of how they see the imperialistic uh, countries of Europe coming in. So those are the names you want to go through this list and really know what I'm talking about when I go through those lists going forward. Um, you know, European contact, missionaries, religion, scramble for Africa, all these things are important, but Mughals of India, Safavids and Persias, uh, not as much as before your course actually starts now, Ottomans and Middle East are huge for you guys to know going forward. Okay, so hopefully you like these videos. Hopefully you find them useful. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Have a good day, guys.